My name is Jimmy. I'm from Somerset, New Jersey, about to be 42 years old, father of two kids and a husband. I've lived in this area my whole life, all around Somerset County, and I have been a landscaper for over 20 years, and I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy hiking, bike riding, camping, spending any time I can out in you know nature with my kids or with my friends. All of that was tested when I had my dogman encounter back in 2017, but it's been a process where I have slowly but surely been making my way back to my quote unquote normal life. As far as my experiences go, I've always had a love hate relationship with uh, werewolves. I didn't learn the term dogman until later, until I believe it was the year 2017. Before then, I just referred to them as werewolves. I remember when I was, I would say seven or eight, I was with a friend of mine and we had just finished trick or treating. He was uh, four years younger than me and he lived across the street. And after we got done trick or treating, we went over to his house and we were just flipping through the TV and just looking for something to watch, some sort of scary movie, a kid's movie. And we accidentally came across a scene from American Werewolf in London. And when I saw that werewolf, it was the first time I've seen one on the silver screen. And it just burned a hole in my memory. So that that was the scariest thing that I had seen up to that point. And then we had moved um, to a bit of a bigger house in 1990. And we stayed there till the year 2001. And that was a time period where I had my first possible experience with, uh, with a dog man. I didn't see anything, but I had heard something. And it was unlike anything else that I've ever heard up to that point. So the story with that goes, it was between when I was 17 and 19. So between 97 and 99, I had a close group of friends that would come over my house in Somerset. Uh, it was a fairly new area where it was still considered the outskirts of the township, but the main road led to three different developments. And my development was the first. And then, you know, you go down the main road a ways. I think the road was called Grouser. And you take Grouser down and, I don't know, maybe half a mile. There was another development on the left. And then Grouser kept going. Eventually, before the road ends, there's the last development and it's on the right. My family is one of the very first families to live in this this outskirt area. So it was quiet. And, you know, it was a lot of farmland. So when my friends would come over, you know, we would do things that, you know, normal teenagers would do and play basketball or just hang in the backyard. You know, I had a trampoline that we would jump on. You know, usually when it got to be late at night in my teens and early 20s, I could uh, hang out till the wee hours of the morning, two, three, four o'clock in the morning on a Friday. Nowadays, a little bit different being a little older. So on this particular night, a friend of mine, I'll call him Steve, we had decided that we were just going to go for a walk down Grouser Road, which was pretty normal. We would walk and we would just talk and sometimes we'd wander into the developments and just kind of, okay, we want to take a right. We'll take a right down the street. And every development was pretty much a combine. So it was just one big circle after another. But on this particular night, we stayed on the main road and it was between 1230 and one o'clock in the morning. We had streetlights 
that were, you know, lighting up the main road. Not overly bright, but enough to guide us on our way. We didn't need flashlights or anything like that. But when we got to this certain point where there was an intersection where Grouser met up with, I forget the name of the other road that it intersected with, but if you went down to the right, there was a man-made pond. And past that pond, there was this road. I actually called it Dark Road. I know, extremely original. But it was very, very dark. I couldn't see the hand in front of your face. I'd gone down there a few times over the years. There was an old legend that there was a cougar down that road, which was a pretty wooded area. There was maybe four houses on that whole street. And I want to say that road was maybe a mile, maybe two miles. But it was very secluded. You know, if I did travel down it, I had I made sure that I was not alone. So we get to this intersection on Grouser and we'll call it Dark Road. And if we want to go down the dark road, we make a right. But we decided to actually stay straight. And I just think that uh, Lady Luck was nowhere to be found that night. Like I said, there was three developments and at that intersection we're crossing the second development and to like the, I would say two o'clock, there was this house that had been built way before there was any other developments. And they had a dog that was either a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd. And I want to say, I want to say it was a Doberman because I have a distinct dislike for Dobermans. I was bit by one when I was a kid, bit me in the face. So ever since then, kind of had a, sore spot with Doberman Pinchers. But this one in particular would bark quite a bit at walkers or bikers. And we were no exception at around the witching hour of 12, 31 o'clock. So we're walking and this dog starts barking at us. And really, it's not a surprise. But all of a sudden, it just stops. Like somebody like turned the volume off on this dog. So I'm walking and my friend Steve is talking about something. I don't know if we're talking about girls or pro wrestling or whatever we normally were talking about. And we heard the loudest, deepest growl. And it was so intense. It just resonated all throughout our bodies. Like somebody just grabbed us and shook us. You might as well have shot off a gun because we took that opportunity to hightail it out of there as fast as possible. I consider Steve a good friend of mine, but at that instant, it was every man for himself. And I took off as fast as I possibly could. Just, I remember thinking to myself, sorry, Steve, but I got to save my own rear end. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize that Steve was a great deal faster than me. So, I started to see him whiz right by me. And now I'm panicking because I'm thinking, oh, man, whatever this is, is going to grab me because I'm the slow one. And so I start panicking even more. And I'm yelling for Steve to stop and slow down and wait for me, you know, because I don't want to get attacked. But I never heard anything after that. You know, it was the growl that lasted maybe 10 seconds. And we didn't even wait for this thing to finish making its noise. We just shot out of there like as quick as possible back the way we came towards my home. You know, once we had stopped running, I would say we probably ran for maybe 100 yards, 150 yards back to the next streetlight, I remember. So, yeah, it was probably about 150 yards once we caught our breath. And, oh, my God, what was that? I don't know. I don't want to walk anymore. Let's just pack it in for the night. So we did. We went back home and, and that was my first encounter, but that was definitely a large canine. Like I said, that Doberman that was at that house, you know, he made a lot of noise, but I mean, he paled in comparison to whatever this thing was that was growling. When it did growl, just to give you a location, uh, I think I was actually closer to the curb on my left. And there was a whole bunch of brush and a little bit of a wooded area. Whatever was sitting there gave us that warning, said, hey, you know, you guys need to 
get out of here. So I was maybe 10, 12 feet from the curb, which was close enough. And like I said, when we heard it, we just got out of there. Toot sweet. I had had a dog, a large, very large black lab. I'll call him Rufus. And Rufus was just a massive, massive black lab. It was the biggest lab still to this day that I've ever seen. And I think at his peak, he probably tipped the scales at about 135 pounds. He was enormous, gentle giant. You know, he lived 10 years. He actually died a week before his 10th birthday. He was my buddy. He was a good friend and he was a good security dog. You know, it was not vicious, but he definitely made you feel secure. Wouldn't harm a fly, but it was, you always felt safe around him. You know, he was one of the group, you know, with my family. You know, we all loved him. But funny thing was that uh, he gave me, nearly gave me a heart attack one time. Uh, I was around the same time. So I was probably like late teens. And um, the way the house was set up where our, my family lived, you walk in the foyer, which had a high ceiling, and then you walk up two flights of stairs. And then my parents' room was at the top of the stairs. And then you walk down this corridor, which was probably, uh, if I had to guess, it would be 35, 40 feet. And my room was all the way at the other end of the hallway. And then my sisters, I have two sisters, each one had a room on either side of me. So usually I was the last one to pack it in for the night, you know, on the weekends. You know, I was always a night owl, whether it was hanging out with my friends or just staying up watching TVs, watching scary movies. You know, I've always been into horror, uh, monster movies. So anyway, there was one particular night where, you know, I was just about to turn in, you know, close my door. And I'd always, I'd always look down the hallway just to kind of like make sure the coast was clear. And this one time I am about to close the door and I look and all of a sudden I see these two glowing eyes and this mouth filled with teeth. I felt the fear just wash over me. I couldn't see myself. I didn't have a mirror, but I, I, I definitely think that I turned completely white as a ghost. You know, three seconds later, I realized that it's my, uh, my dog had come upstairs to check on me and just pay me a visit. You know, he wasn't allowed upstairs, but I was not one to turn him in to my parents. So I let him come down the hallway, you know, hang out in my room for a little bit. And then he took it upon himself to just go back down the hallway, go back down the stairs, you know, and go lay in the kitchen like he normally did. Kind of a funny thing where I, I honestly was terrified for about three seconds, not realizing like, what is, what is that thing at the end of the hallway? Cause you don't expect to see anything. You just, you know, you check for the boogeyman, but you don't necessarily expect to see the boogeyman or the big black dog who's staring at you, just kind of waiting to lick your face. So my main encounter, like I said, took place in August of 2017. My girlfriend and I were living with her parents in Montgomery. I want to say it was around dusk, maybe a little before, you know, New Jersey, summertime, you know, August, it's getting dark around like 7.30, 8 o'clock. So this probably took place around like 6 o'clock. I can't, I was, I never wear a watch and I wasn't wearing one that day and I didn't happen to check my phone. But from what I remember, it was, the sun was starting to go down, but there's still plenty of, of light where my now in-laws live was in Montgomery. They live at the bottom of a hill in a fairly wooded area and my girlfriend and I, we would have bonfires in her parents' backyard. So to set up how their house is and their property is, if you see their house from the road, it's like in the shape of a rectangle. So their house is pretty much smack in the middle. Uh, you go up their driveway, which is in the shape of a horseshoe and the top right section of that rectangle 
is a grassy area that's probably, I don't know, I wouldn't say more than 20 yards deep. Past that, there's a tree line of woods. There is a house that's in those woods because there's another side street. There's a good distance, 50 to 75 yards between the two houses. And then it's a fairly thick wooded area on the left side of the property is their front yard. Their front yard only is like, it's not the complete front of the property because the rest of it is the driveway. But in the backyard on the left side, it's kind of marshy. Always seems to be a little muddy back there. That's all woods. So like I said, we had decided to do a bonfire on a Saturday. This encounter takes place from Saturday into a Sunday. So we had had about 10 to 12 of our friends over on the Saturday for the bonfire. And when you walk up to their house on the right side, it leads right into the deck, pretty good sized deck. You know, you can sit about a dozen people or maybe more than as the rest of the backyard. And then the bonfire is like right in the middle of the backyard. So we're sitting all back there. And I have my back to the woods, so I'm facing the house. And then the rest of my friends are, everybody's just spaced out, kind of sitting around the bonfire. We're just talking. You know, we had music playing. We were trying to be courteous of neighbors, so, you know, we didn't have the music up too loud or anything like that. But, you know, just, it's, you know, we're not a loud bunch. Jokes and conversations and drinking beer and having a good time, just enjoying the summer night. And then... I mean, I want to say it was around 11 o'clock, maybe 10 or 11, but it was definitely dark. So I'm sitting there and all of a sudden, just subtly, you start to hear these coyotes. Now, coyotes in New Jersey is very common, but this was the very first time that I had heard coyotes other than at a zoo. So I looked at my girlfriend and I said, is that coyotes? Is that normal? And she's like, yeah, but I haven't heard them in a, quite a while and they sounded fairly close but i know that's a common misconception where like they sound like they're like next door but they could be a quarter of a mile away so i wasn't overly concerned but still like i had my back to the woods so i was like you know what i'm just gonna change my seat so that i can have the woods on my left have the house on my right and then uh i had because <laughs> i'm a walking dead buff I had the uh, the baseball bat loose steel, which is wrapped in barbed wire behind me. I was uh, showing that to a couple of friends of mine because, you know, we all follow that show. So I was like, all right, you know what? I think I'm just going to kind of hang on to this bat. And it just kind of changed the mood a little bit because the coyotes were howling for at least two minutes. They just seemed to be kind of running through. But it was enough to just kind of get everybody's attention. I mean, like I said, we're in the woods. Obviously, we're not the only ones in the woods. Like I said, coyotes are somewhat normal. There was um, like a bear sighting, I think like one in like the past eight, 10 years in that area. So even though it's not common, you know, you do have to be aware. And one thing I forgot to mention was my girlfriend had a large German Shepherd. And he was like my dog many years earlier. This dog was huge. And I mean, I'm between six foot and six one. And when this dog stood up, he was easily six and a half feet tall. I mean, he was huge. Another gentle giant. As long as he recognized your scent, you know, you were good. But he was going crazy at the time in the house as the coyotes were barking. It just, Kind of made me realize, like, all right, you know what? Maybe we should bring him outside for a little bit of security. That was really it for that night. However, the following evening is where I had my face-to-face -face encounter. So Saturday, we had our friends over. Sunday night, my girlfriend and her parents had some of their family members over, like her grandmothers, you know, some of her aunts and uncles. I want to say it was between like eight and 10 people. So I had to run to my car in the driveway for some reason. And I was walking up to the house. And this is probably, like I said, around dusk 
So it was 6.30 in the evening. And um, as I'm walking up, I see my girlfriend's mom and a couple of the other ladies there. And they're paying attention to this tree, this dogwood tree that's being shaken violently, like back and forth, almost like Andre the Giant was like at the base of this tree and just really going to town, just shaking it quite a bit, quite violently. And it, it got some attention from everybody. Nobody really went out to investigate. So the tree, just to give you a visual, the tree is in the wood line about, I would say from like from the deck, it was maybe about 50 feet away, maybe a little closer, you know, and the tree shaking went on for, I would say a good minute. It seemed like a while, like something was really going to town on this poor tree. Nothing ever broke, but it definitely got shaken quite a bit. So once that stopped, everybody kind of just resumed what they were doing. My girlfriend's father was grilling. I don't know, maybe that attracted some attention. And I would say an hour later, still had some light. I'm sitting on the deck and I'm facing the woods. And I failed to mention before that in the backyard on the right side, there was a half basketball court, you know, with blacktop. And then my girlfriend's father had put up a basketball hoop, which, you know, is 10 foot high, just to give you a little gauge. That will come into play in a minute. And then next to the basketball court. So if you're looking out on the deck, the basketball court is at your two o'clock. And then right next to that on the left side is like a long canopy that he fills up with firewood. So, and like I said, I'm about, you know, just a little over six feet tall and I can walk into the canopy uh, without ducking. So the top of that canopy is probably about six and a half, seven feet. So either way, so we're, we're finishing up dinner and My girlfriend's father is sitting across from me and he's talking about politics or football or, you know, whatever. And I'm kind of just like zoning out, just like looking at the trees and just watching the sun come down. The dog, the German Shepherd is actually at my feet, just resting, just maybe just waiting for scraps to fall. But he's just chilling out, really not paying attention to anybody or anything. So I look beyond where my girlfriend's father is talking and I look towards the basketball hoop and I notice that there's a figure. The best way to describe it is a German shepherd head. It looked almost identical to the dog that was sitting at my feet. The first thing I noticed was the ears. The ears were black and they were sticking up uh, like a normal shepherd's would. And it had the brown fur that a shepherd has, like a long leg, I should call them like the cheeks or the side of the face, but they were, it was darker than like a normal shepherd's, which are kind of like tan. It had a black muzzle. I did not see any teeth, but I did see like the wet of the nose that was a little bit shiny. I can make that out. And its hair seemed a little bit longer than usual than like on a normal German Shepherd. Well, as I'm looking at this thing, I actually looked away for a moment and I looked down at the dog that was at my feet. And I look up again and I'm like, well, he's not reacting. And it is completely zoned in on me. I mean, I was fearful. I definitely was like, what is this thing that I'm looking at? It was standing in the tree line And I would say from me on the deck to where it was, was probably about 40 or 50 feet. And it was standing almost directly behind the basketball hoop so that I could still see, like, I could see the back. It was like right next to like the backboard, but maybe back like two or three feet. The odd thing was that if that hoop, which was regulation 10 feet, This dog man had to be between 11 and 12 feet. Now, I did say that my girlfriend's family, they live at the bottom of a hill. So 
you know, there is an incline in those woods, you know, you're walking up the hill. So I wasn't sure if the dog man, true type being, a let, just for sake of argument, let's just say 11 feet. I didn't know if, if that was its true height or if it's standing on a rock or if it's just, you know, standing on an incline. But this thing is, is just staring at me. It's not moving at all. And I'm looking at it, but in my peripherals, I'm looking at everybody else. Now, my girlfriend's father, he's got his back to it, so he's not going to see it. And nobody else seems to be paying attention. So I'm wondering, like, what is going on? Like, nobody else sees this thing. And and don't get me wrong. I mean, it was very well camouflaged. And if, if I wasn't paying attention as closely as I was to just... Because I, that's just something I always do. I always scan my surroundings. I've always done that. So I'm looking at this dog man who's staring back at me. And I felt, honestly, I've never been in this situation. Thank goodness. But I felt like somebody was pointing a gun at me. Like, you're not going to do anything foolish. You know, I definitely felt that this dog man had some sort of control and was zoning in on me specifically so i stared at this thing for uh, i felt like forever but it was maybe two or three minutes honestly and then eventually my girlfriend came up behind me and you know just put her hand on my shoulder i jumped like a little bit and she asked me and she always asks me this she's now my wife and she's I get on her for it. Sometimes she just says, Hey, are you okay? And I looked at her a little bewildered and maybe I had an expression on my face that I was a little nervous. And I looked at her, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And then when I went to go look back towards the basketball hoop where the dog man was, it was gone. So I took that opportunity to get up out of my seat and get off the deck and I actually started walking towards the basketball hoop. And the only thing that I saw on this dog man was its head. I never saw any body. I never saw any legs. I never saw shoulders. It was like it was just peeking its head just enough so that I could see it was there. And that was it. Unfortunately, I only had the head to go by. But it was without question you now a canine. Like, I wouldn't say, like, the head was, like, overly large. I mean, I would say it was twice the size of a normal shepherd's. But other than that and being 11 to 12 feet in the air, it honestly just looked like, you know, a German shepherd head. It was almost like that scene in Alice in Wonderland where you see the Cheshire cat and you just see the head. That's pretty close to to what I saw. Never showed any aggression. Just kind of let me know that I'm assuming it was he, that he was there. So I get down off the deck and I'm walking towards it, walking towards the area where I saw it. And I just happened to look at the at the ground and the ground where it would have been standing was flat and it didn't have an incline until about 10 feet further away. This thing was true to form you know, about its height, how tall it was, which is pretty enormous. And once I saw that, and then once I realized that, I don't know where this thing is, because it it didn't make a sound. It never made not one sound, and it just disappeared. And that's when the fear really kicked in. And that fear took a vice grip hold of me for the next three to four years. I constantly thought that I was being watched. I was very much into the outdoors. I loved camping and hiking and all that. You know, I have two kids, you know, and they love spending time with dad and going for nature walks and, you know, going for bike rides and stuff like that. I couldn't do that. Like the paranoia that I felt was so intense and it was on a daily basis. I'm a landscaper. I've been a landscaper for over 20 years. And I take 
care of a lot of properties all around Somerset County. Yeah, you know, I would say at least half of those sites are wooded areas. So whether I'm cutting grass or trimming bushes, like there's woods there and constantly just paranoid about what is, you know, lurking in the shadows. It affected every aspect of my life. I didn't know how to handle it because I'd never been confronted with something like this before. I mean, it's one thing to be, you know, scared of something that, oh, this just exists in Hollywood. But now, literally staring you in the face, you know, now you're expecting to like to see it again. And, you know, what if this time it's more violent, you know, and a whole bunch of what ifs. So I told my girlfriend about it. I told some of my close friends about it. I did not tell like my parents or anybody really in my family. There's just certain people that I trust in my life that I can tell anything to. And I don't have to worry about being ridiculed or being made fun of. I'm a pretty honest guy. And I'm pretty, I accept my flaws and I'm very good at laughing at myself. But I think people saw that when I was telling about my encounters with this dog man, you could see the fear in my eyes. So right after the encounter, I had excused myself from everybody and I went to the downstairs level of the house. My girlfriend and I, we were actually going to be moving soon to the next town over to an apartment. We had a uh, second floor apartment that we were moving to, which was great. You know, especially after having just experienced this dog man encounter. And so I went downstairs and I just started packing up some of my clothes. And like I said, I'm a horror movie buff. You know, I like anything that's scary. So I just, you know, I went on YouTube and whatever was on my playlist. And then I came across your show. And the very first episode that I listened to of your show, Vic, was episode 83 with Daniel Stedman and her dog man encounter. I don't know if I've listened to every episode, but I would say at least 90%. And still to this day, that episode that Daniel Stedman was on with how descriptive she was, I felt like I was there with her every step of the way. I mean, she was, it gave a very good visual about what she experienced, you know, the smells and everything. I mean, it was just so captivating is the wrong word. It was, it was horrifying. I felt for her for, you know, having to go through that. My experience wasn't, wasn't aggressive, wasn't dramatic. It was traumatic. You know, I started listening to that encounter and then I fell down the rabbit hole of just, then I started hearing the term dog man. You know, I wanted to learn more, but at the same time, the more I learned, it didn't really help because it's like the more that I was learning, I wasn't liking what I was learning. You know, like, yes, these things are real. Dogman, werewolf, like these have always been like my kryptonite. Like, I, I think they're amazing creatures, but at the same time, they just terrify me to the nth degree. So even still to this day, if I come across like, you know, a movie that has a werewolf in it. It's like, I'll look, I'll like close my eyes, but then I'll look like, keep one eye open. And it's like, oh, it's, it's cool. But it's like, as long as it's on the screen, you know, we're good. So we move into the apartment and I uh, was talking with some of my close friends. I confided in a, a buddy of mine that I went to high school with. And I told them about everything that I just said here. And he said, you know, Jimmy, I can't confirm or deny that this creature is real or not because I have never seen it. So I don't know. But the fear that you felt was 100% real. So your emotions, everything is 100% valid. You know, if this is the way that this made you feel, then, you know, you felt that for a reason. That really resonated with me and stuck with me. It was a very simple way to put it. I think most people can relate to fear. You know, you can learn to control fear. It's not easy. It's a, it's a process, but it was the first step that I was able to take towards 
my quote unquote recovery. You know, it was two or three years of not being able to do the things that I love to do. I, I would love going for a hike. I couldn't. I was just too paranoid. You know, I would love to take my boys fishing. Well, you know what? Why don't you go with your grandfather and I'll just kind of hang at home. You know, and it was, I was like, you know what? I can't live like this. I'm not somebody who just will lay down and accept defeat. Like, I'm a fighter. So I was determined to try to find a way to beat this thing, not physically, obviously, but how do I get my life back? You know, it was very frustrating. And my poor girlfriend, you know, she watched me go through all this and she's not a believer, but she definitely sympathizes and she's there for me in any way that she can be. You know, she always lets me talk about it, which is wonderful. And I couldn't ask for more. You know, then I talked to another friend of mine. I'll call her Cordelia. That's not her real name, but she's very spiritual. She's very much into energies, you know, and I've known this girl a long, long time. I'm, like I said, I'm almost 42 and I've known her since I was 12. So it's a long time and I trust her. You know, we, we were always, we've always been buddies and you know, we can always talk about anything. Uh, unfortunately, when we were kids, we're the same age. You know, when we were teenagers, we would dabble with the Ouija board. And, you know, being 15, 14 years old and, you know, just looking for something to do, maybe get in a little bit of trouble, let's break out the Ouija board. We would dabble in that, you know, and then we realized how dangerous that can be, opening up portals to other dimensions. I had a priest, a Catholic priest, tell me that you should stay away from Ouija boards, you know, because you don't know what you're messing with. And I took heed with that, and I haven't used a Ouija board in over 20 years. But with that friend of mine, I met up with her at a restaurant, and I, I again, I told her everything. She told me very simply. She's like, Jimmy, what you're doing is you're calling it in. You're sending out this energy. It's almost like you're a beacon, and that's why this thing came to see you. And that's why ever since you've been afraid because you're calling it in, like you're subconsciously like attracting it. So you can start to try to reverse that. Then, you know, you can start to heal. The last thing that I want to mention is the dream that I had. I've been on the road to recovery, so to speak, you know, after my encounter in 2017 till the pandemic till 2020, I remember. I woke up for work and I had had this dream that was very specific. I was in a pickup truck in my dream. I was driving in a quarry and I was, I remember I was intent on finding this dog man. And so I was chasing it, uh, but I couldn't see it. I could almost like sense it, but like I couldn't get a visual. I remember being in like this cold as of like a quarry looking around and I don't see it. So I turn my truck around and I'm heading out of the woods. And then I got this feeling next to me where I'm driving along and on the driver's side window, first thing I see is just this head of what looks like a wolf. It's almost looked like, the, I mean, it was enormous. It looked like the cross between a wolf and a dragon. It was just monstrous. So uh, it had like white eyes, no pupils, and, you know, it had its teeth bared and it's keeping pace with my truck. And I dare not look directly at it because I'm trying to stay on the dirt road. And this thing is keeping pace with my truck and it's like escorting me out of the woods. And then I woke up. It was mostly black with a little bit of like gray or silver, like it was old. So I woke up and I'm not really a morning person anyways, but on this particular morning, I was very quiet. My girlfriend, who now had become my wife, I did my morning routine. You know, I told her I talked to her at lunch and then I left. And then as I'm leaving my development, it's like this message popped in my head. It was the first 
thing I had said that day. And, it, you know, I got this message from that, I believe it was from that dream. And it said, you know, we exist. We haven't hurt you. Stop looking for us or you will be sorry. And once I said that out loud, I gripped that steering wheel so tight and I felt a shiver run through my body because I knew that was a direct message from these creatures that, hey, we're here and we're not messing with you, but stop looking for us. Be careful what you wish for because it's not that you're wishing to to see us, but I'm basically doing what my friend said and I'm calling them in. That was, I want to say, April of 2020. Ever since then, we had moved again. There was an opportunity for us to move to um, a family member's house. So my wife's grandmother, she was too old to live by herself. So we um, were asked to move into this house and take care of it, which, as luck would have it, is in the woods. <laughs> so, and so here we are again, which is right where I'm sitting on two and a half acres, not too far from Princeton. And um, I'd been here a handful of times before we actually lived here. And this place gets dark. I mean, you're not too far from civilization or anything, but it you're in the woods. So it's um, it's like its own island. And there's a lot of farmland, a decent amount of houses, but, you know, everybody's pretty well spaced out. So when we first came here, you know, and I saw the place at night, I said to my wife, I said, babe, we need to light this property up. <laughs> and she knew exactly what I was talking about. I didn't really need to explain myself. And since then, I've put up, you know, a number of spotlights and a number of motion detectors. We do have a lot of fox that run through here, a lot of deer, a ton of deer, you know, all the little critters, you know. And actually, over the weekend, uh, we did hear another pack of coyotes. I would say since we've moved here, so it's been about a year, year and a half, maybe two years, we've heard them maybe half a dozen times. You know, they like to stir up the neighborhood dogs. It's unnerving, but at the same time, it's like, look, this is where we live. And, you know, they have a right to be here, too. I mean, I have a fair amount of, you know, home security weaponry. If push comes to shove, I will, you know, defend my family. I'm not looking for trouble, but if trouble comes to find me, then I like to think that I um, I would be ready for, you know, whatever the case may be, whether it's a burglar or a wild dog or whatever. And having my kids out here, they're a little older, they're 10 and 13. And I told them, I said, look, you know, you guys, I want you to go outside, go play, get dirty. You don't need me and your mother to watch you all the time. So I came up with a compromise, honestly, more so for my own sake than, than anything. But I went out and I bought a set of walkie talkies, one for each member of the family. So we got four. And I said, look, we'll use these walkie talkies. If I need you guys to go out and pick up sticks or, you know, you play in the front yard, you play in the backyard. And then we have a third section of the property, which I call the mini woods, which butts up to the cornfield. And then past the cornfield is um, a tree line. So, you know, they know to stay, you know, not too far away from the house. They get two acres to run around, and then the last half acre they know just to stay out of because um, it's out of, you know, you can't see it from the house. Luckily, the back of the house has a lot of windows where you could see 100% of the property in the backyard. You know, we don't need to be on top of them. They can go out and they can play. And then if they get into trouble, just radio me and I'll be out as quick as a flash. So, you know, it's been a process. And uh, it definitely has been very stressful. But the more I talk about it, you know, with my my friends, people I trust, you know, the easier it gets. I don't pretend that these dogmen and other beings don't exist. But at the same time, like, 
we got to learn to coexist. You know, I'm here, they're here. I'm not looking to step on any toes and just um, continue to live my life, you know, the best that I can. If you've had a dog man encounter and would like to talk with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know.